Okay, well, it's great to be back in my former stamping ground and to see you your faces again. It's been such a lovely day. So, the title of my talk Beyond Plates, uh, Far from Conversion to TEM, I use in conductive ellipsoids. And I'd like to acknowledge firstly Ian Montaigne, who's certainly no longer with us, who kindly ran his 3D program and gave me something with which to validate uh, my system and solution for ellipsoids. Secondly, Dennis, who provided the data for the Raven Lake Heli Sam and also supplied slides and lots of technical background. And finally, Scott Napier from Mira, who assisted with technical background for the downhole team that I'll be showing you. Okay, there's so the outline, uh, introduction, and the motivation for this work, and then talk about the conductive lipsoid uh, forward, forward modeling for both resistive and inductive limits. Uh, briefly describe the inversion uh, algorithm, and then go, like, run you through a couple of examples and uh, conclusions. So the motivation for modeling conductive ellipsoids is firstly that um, ellipsoids offer a, a much wider variety of shapes than conductive plates. Conductive plates are obviously very effective in many situations, but not all targets of interest are thin and planar. And so there are circumstances, I think, where uh, having access to a wider variety of shapes is beneficial for us. Um, the ellipsoids are, are attractive also because in the limits of early and late time, they're quite tractable mathematical solutions. So hence of focusing on the inductive and resistive limits. Uh, and uh, the solutions are fast because we can treat it as a magnetostatic. And finally, uh, use that as a basis for the fast conversion. And just if you needed any convincing that not all Interesting targets are planar and, and, and let alone rectangular. You don't need to do too much digging in two logical uh, textbooks to find a few examples. These are obviously 2D, but clearly in 3D, you can get very complex shapes and uh, make it difficult to fit those or explain those in terms of in rectangular conducting plates. The motivation for confining attention to the resistive limit and the inductive limit in particular. So late time responses are generally of, of interest to us if we're looking for base metal mineralization, because generally we're looking for conductive targets and we're also looking generally for buried targets. And in the, it's in the late stages that we really define those kinds of targets. So it's, it's not too much of a limitation to focus on resistive limit if our ultimate objective is looking for you know, compact conductive or half conductive bodies. Uh, in the resist limit, the, the current is spatially stable, and so we can then invert on pretty much on shape alone, which is the advantageous. And in the resistive limit, interactions between conductors are pretty pretty minimal, pretty negligible, and we can therefore add responses from con conductors by uh, linear superposition of errors from individual conductors without uh, risking too much uh, error. And likewise, in the, in the inductive limit, especially when we're looking for the nickel, um, we often encounter extremely, extremely good conductors, and uh, they respond essentially in the inductive limit. The currents I can find the surface of those bodies. And so the inductive limit is a very good approximation for extremely conductive bodies. And again, uh, in the inductive limit, the response from the sphere or from any, like any ellipsoid can be modeled using magnetostatic methods. So, both in the resistive and inductive limits, we can use magnetostatic methods. And the thing that's static in both cases is the current distribution. So, you've got a spatially uh, unit or spatially stable the currents, and so then we can apply the best magnetostatic uh, approach. I want to draw the distinction between the mathematical resistive limit and the physical resistive limit. This caused a bit of confusion for me, for others. So, in the mathematical uh, definition, the resistive limit is the integral over all time. Where's the, where's the laser? Uh, the green dot. 
in the in the mathematical system, we really can only write the the equal response over all the time, and in that limit, we're dealing with a, a simple uh, homogeneous conductor in in free space. Then the result will be proportional conductivity, and that's a nice mathematical result, and it reduces the decay to a single number, which is advantageous from a computational point of view. Possibly not advantageous from an interpretive point of view, but nevertheless, that's a point said for it. If we're dealing with real data, and of course we're limited to a finite range of time, so depending on what range of delays we've actually measured, then that'll determine what possible range of time you can use to go to integrate the data. And of course, we can decide within this available range what channel channels we are to use to try to do it and create moment data, in other words time interval data of our decays and we've got control as to which channels we actually want. The physical resistive limit refers to the late stage when the currents are in fact stable. So they're diffused throughout the body and in terms of their spatial distribution, they're now stable. They're in a discrete conductor, they'll be decaying exponentially with time. They won't be changing the actual distribution in space. It's that distinguishes it from the mathematical resistive limit because that integrating over all time from the shut off of the transmitter, the early uh, evolution of the currents that they transform from the graphic mm -hmm. limit through to the resistive limit. So we've got all of that other uh, transition involved in the mathematical limit. And it's in the physical resistive limit that we can use the magnetostatic approach. So we're talking about the currents are now set, we can then apply the magnetostatic approach. So we're looking in, in, a, in applying the magnetostatic approach properly, we're looking for that final stage of the decay when there's not much change in the shape of the responses, ignoring the very unfavorable first and so on. In the resistive limit, we can say that it's characteristic that the shapes of the responses are going to change much more. So looking at an example, we're progressing from early to intermediate to late time dips and downhole data. So we've got uh, changing the shape of the profiles with time early on at mid times. But when we get into the late stage in this uh, favorable situation, so we've got some discrete conductors near our, near our holes, we're seeing that there's very little or relatively little change in shape at this late stage. Um, apart from some noise, which we can hopefully ignore. And at this stage, then we can apply the resistive limit solution with a fair degree of confidence. And in fact, you can play around and, and look for groups of channels that in fact change with time very little and give yourself extra confidence that in fact you'd be dealing with a range of times where the resistive limit approximation is a good one. And so this is just to illustrate for that data set in the previous slide, if we look at channels 17 to 21, we're getting pretty good uh, consistency or stability in terms of the shapes as we move from one channel to another. So that gives us extra confidence that the resistive limit solution is going to be okay. Um, so the forward modeling uh, needed to, to develop uh, a new algorithm uh, that was guided by the solution in Grant West sphere. So I extended that to account for all the uh, triaxial ellipsoids. And then with some help from Eve and it's a couple of analytic solutions convinced myself that's probably okay. Um, the resistive current in the in ellipsoid is varies or increases linearly from the center of the ellipsoid to the to the outside surface. So you've got a linear increasing current density. For a triaxial ellipsoid, there are three current nodes, one related to each of the principal directions. So depending on the orientation of the primary field, we'll determine whether we get one, two, or three nodes excited within the body. Uh, the effective magnetization is constant in direction, but it varies uh, radially in amplitude. And uh, oh, in, in, the, in the program, the existing limit response is combined with a homogeneous host response that are trying to take some sort of account of any background effects that we have. And finally, we can account for uh, 
uh, susceptibility. So if you have a body which is both conductive and susceptible, we can take that into account. So this is just to illustrate on the left, this is the magnetization uh, in the ellipsoid in the resistive limit. So we're getting an increase from the zero at the, at the boundaries, at the degrees, at the increases of what the quadratic seems to a maximum in the center. And we're getting uh, elliptical current paths for the current flow. Depending on exactly what orientation our primary field is, we'll determine which of the modes is excited, but generally it will be three. And then looking at the current distribution, uh, just one of those nodes, the current uh, increases from the center to the uh, outside edge. And this is a, it's not terribly eccentric, but you can get the, uh, the, the current density is in fact stronger on this the shorter dimension here, because we need that the net. Uh, total net current must be the same on both, both dimensions there. And we get an, an increase in the current in the shorter, shorter dimension of the uh, ellipse. Should have made that one a bit more eccentric to make the numbers clearer. And then on the right, on the left hand side, you can see there the linear increase in current from the center out to the uh, and then, yes, as I mentioned in passing, in addition to the ellipsoid responses, so we might have one or several ellipsoids, and then combining that with a continuous background response, so this is from a homogeneous half space. And so again, we've, we've integrated our data over a certain time range, so we want to combine that with the same time range from a homogeneous half space. But this is pretty pretty crude way to represent the background. But generally, by the time you you into the late time, it's uh, satisfactory most of the time, and it's not perfect by any means. But it's crude, but we're, we're dealing with late time responses, and so it's generally okay. But so this is just to illustrate the response from a half space in the resistive limits. So we're getting the smoke ring current fusing. And for ground data, we get this maybe called well, this is the Z component on the left, the X component on the right there. And likewise, underground, we also get a response from the half space in the underground. What I think is interesting in this one is that we, even though this is the resistive limit, when you're talking about the mathematical resistive limits, so we're integrating here over all time. In fact, we're still getting the impression of a current system which is kind of concentrated quite close to the surface. It's quite interesting, I think, that even we indicate over all time, we're still being someone that's dominated by the by the loop. We're still being a, a current system which is kind of focused quite close to the surface. But in when we use the uh, solution, we normally will be looking at some finite late time range. This is looking at all time. We'd be looking at a different different map. We're thinking of just one time range of interest. And in fact, that's illustrated here how the uh, half space response changes time interval. So, up top here, you can see different time intervals. First one is over all time, that's the dash time. And then we've got other time intervals here. And you can see how the, the response, in this case, case the vertical uh, half space response varies as we change the time range. And also, there's a difference between the response within the B field and the different field. And the differences are perhaps a bit more important for the horizontal component against its underground data. I've mentioned that. So, this is good. We had a hole drilled from the center of a loop of 45 degrees. And so, again, there's all time profile in the dashed, identical for the B field and the BBT. And at other times, we get a difference between the uh, the B field and the, uh, the BDT data. And also, we get a change in the shapes, the underground moment response. And so, these are could be taken into account in some of those. So, uh, the inductive limit. So, in that case, the currents are confined to the surface. Uh, in the on time the secondary field produced by the ellipsoid will null the small component, the primary field at the boundary, at the surface of the ellipsoid. And the inductive limit is governed or completely controlled by the geometry, the shape, size, 
different orientation of the conductor. So it's actually independent of the conductor. Well, the conductivity, but the conductivity will be very high. Uh, and uh, the magnetization is the effective magnetization is, is uniform thickness. And then diagrammatically, just to show the variation in orientation of effective magnetization in the different cases. So if we're thinking of magnetostatics, in stealthy magnetization, we'll rotate the magnetization closer to the long dimensions ellipsoid. And when we get into EM, then in the inductive limit or the resistive limit, we're rotating the effective magnetization closer to the shorter dimensions of the ellipsoid. If that makes sense. If we've got an oblate body, we know that we're going to get current mostly focused in the large dimensions of the body. So the magnetization is going to be more to that as parallel to the short or thinnest dimension of the body. Okay, so in terms of inversion, I'm not going to go into any of the mathematical detail, details. It's pretty standard as matrix inversion and uh, set up to invert for one or several uh, ellipsoids. The user has control over which bodies are actually changing. So you can keep some fixed if you wish and you can decide which of the parameters are going to be changed or kept fixed. And uh, also, if you wish, you can impose bounds <coughs> on the, uh, the ranges. And finally, a uh, minor point out, because ellipsoids have volume, then when I talk of conductance, it'll be using this. But the conductivity times the one third root of the volume. It's just my definition, it might not be the case, but anyway, it's at least it'll have the same dimensions as we used to. <clears throat> and these are a few details, not too important, I guess, but um, in order to avoid any problems with uh, normalization, Different uh, with parameters that have different physical dimensions, a group of parameters. To, so I run inversion with firstly just the positional dimension with, with the conductivity, then, then I run second inversion changing the uh, radii, it's all radii of the ellipsoid, and then I run with just the angles. But I mean, that's fairly, a fairly minor esoteric point. Uh, same for the uh, in the inductive limit case, again, the conductivity is not involved in that, in that case. And then finally, because the spheres are quite uh, independent of this, or strike plunge and tilt, of the sphere has no bearing on the, on the response, then it's generally better to distort. If you want to start with a body that's pretty much spherical, better to distort it a little bit and get use the program something a bit more. Again, not a critical thing, but just a general recommendation, if you like. <clears throat> so now a couple of examples, uh, a downhole data set from the North American nickel deposit, I can't be more specific than that. And then secondly, talk about inversion of a heli sand from Murchison Minerals uh, Raven Lake deposit in Saskatchewan. And in these uh, inversion slides, I'll be also comparing the ellipsoid inversion with other, with smooth inversions run with a different program, VPEN 3D. So again, it's an inversion program for resistive limit data. And the main difference is that it breaks up the ground into a rectangular mesh of cells and allows the conductivity to vary or change as required by the data within those cells. So it's more, I guess, more conventional 3D inversion, assisting from the parametric sort of inversion. So there'll be some comparison of the two inversion results. So this first example is from a North American nickel copper PGE deposit. And this is the context on the left here. We've got two two drill holes and a and a, a body which is a mixed sulfide but mostly disseminated sulfides. Uh, it's three component TEM. Here are the time uh, time ranges posted for you. A 1.2 millisiemen per meter background has been used, so that's that's the optimal background for this particular area. So it's about 800 ohm meter background 
is included in the response. And then there's a smooth inversion run with deep in 3D, as well as a inversion with the ellipsoid parametric program using three ellipsoids uh, and starting with the slightly distorted spheres, including between 30 and 28 of the radii initially. And then it's basically unconstrained, except that the radii are not allowed to exceed 100 meters. So this is the uh, before and after locations on view. So the, the bodies with an eye are the initial positions, and two of them uh, don't move very much during the inversion. You can see that this third body is moved quite substantially, 100 meters south, 25 meters west and so on. I positioned the starting models in this case using the um, smooth model, the smooth model inversion. Uh, but clearly, this this uh, body here, or this location, it was not critically important, um, and so it shifted that quite substantially during the inversion. Here is a view of the uh, ellipsoids that were produced during the inversion, and I was very pleased in this example to see that we now do have. Uh, quite a substantial change in shape in all three. We've got one prolate body and one oblate body and one kind of arbitrary shaped body. So that to me is, is good. And I was very encouraged that here we have a data set where in fact we do move away from a plate-like bodies. And we've got three quite different shapes. Uh, the data has driven it uh, in that direction. So that was good. And that's in a way kind of an, an endorsement of what I've set out to do. Is that, there's some safe data sets where it is useful to have at least you've got an alternative solution uh, where you allow things to change shape. The other good news is that in this particular area there are lensoidal type mineralized zones, so it's kind of a uh, deposit where there are conduits of sulfides, some, sometimes surrounded by halos of mineralization. And so it does make sense to have elongate conductors uh, interpreted just from the geological context. So that was good as well. So a few other parameters, values you know, posted there on the left. And uh, you can see that the, this is the weakest conductor. And in fact, that one is out in the host rock. Some are sediment, perhaps a cementonized zone, not, not, you know, not nickel copper mineralization. But these two are within the fine uh, mineralized zone. So it's the fit to the data from one hole, one of the loops. So it's quite a decent kind of fit. It's not by any means perfect. The fit is is equally good on the other holes <coughs> below elevation zero. So in the in the depth range of interest for that particular zone of sulfides. Up high, we probably need another loop sort if we wanted to fit the data well. So above zero, there's another conductor in the So I could have gone back and put that in as well. But for the purposes of the exercise, that was uh, that bit bad, what I thought. And then this is a comparison of the <clears throat> smooth model. It doesn't look very smooth, it's fairly chunky looking, but you know what I'm talking about. And superimposed are uh, the ellipsoids so that they, in a qualitative way, they're quite consistent with one another, getting it to like an illustration of one uniqueness there. Did, did you say you? Use that information as a starting model for your to, to position the starting ellipsoids. Yeah, mm -hmm. use that. And there was another uh, conductive zone out here on the uh, east, which I also parked one of the ellipsoids out there. And then that moved around. That's, that's this elongate one starting positions out here. But it was still based on a localized zone of conduct conductivity from the smooth model. Obviously, not important. And then that's looking at the whole situation in plan. So, again, on the left, we've got plan view of the smooth model inversion, and here plan view of the ellipsoids. Again, qualitative point of view, they're at least fairly consistent. So that's right. No gross, uh, obvious discrepancies here. Okay, so moving on now to the uh, Braven Lake Elisam. And so Braven Lake is a BMS model, it's a few uh, 
gold and silver credits located in northeastern Saskatchewan. And it is geologically similar to the Flinklong deposit, which isn't that far away. Um, so a few details there as to the nature of the survey. So in Helisam, as you may already know, it measures the component of the TEM parallel to the Earth's field. And in this location, the Earth's field is very steep. So we've got some the data that is close to close to vertical in terms of the component of actual measure. And then Helisam, a large loop is laid out on the ground. The helicopter is used to measure the response above ground. I don't know if my space is the appropriate. I think you're at 50 meters of line space. So, again, uh, BPM 3D has been run on this data by Discovery, uh, comparing that with the results parametric ellipsoid inversion, again, with three ellipsoids. So, on the left here, we have the topography. See that the deposit close to a lake there just out. And this is uh, on the right a plan of residual data. So, what has been subtracted is a half space response. And in this case, the uh, half space was point, about 0.4 millisiemens per meter, or in other words, 2500 ohm meter background is subtracted. So, they're really Two main anomalies, one fairly shallow anomaly, which is known behind mineralization. And then you can probably just make out this anomaly here, weak anomaly here in the south. The newer prospect. So, this is just to illustrate the background field. So, on the left there, you can see we've got. Virtually an apical simple, simple peak with virtually measuring the vertical component of the area. This is the background. Don't get this half space response. You can see it's it's not by any means dominant, but it is now still have an appreciable effect on the data, even though we're talking about 25 millimeter ground. And it's an illustration of the, the loop itself, and then the starting model in this case was based on a VPM 3D compact body inversion. So I used the VPM 3D to define sites where a conductive body was going to be most effective in reducing the misfit. So the program looks for the cells within its uh, rectangular mesh, so the individual cell which is going to reduce the misfit most on its own. And then each iteration again looks does the same experiment, which cell in the mesh will produce the misfit most, most rapidly on its own. So I use those cells as seeds. It creates like, conductors around those seeds. And it, potentially it's useful for uh, other inversions as well. So in this case, I've taken those seed positions and centered the ellipsoids there to save the time during the parametric uh, inversion. Uh, so here we have uh, some profiles after inversion. So this upper one is for the shallow anomaly. You have to excuse me if I basically flip the data over here. So south is at the top. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the fit we get over the shallower anomaly. Red is uh, calculated, black is the measure. And then this is the fit over the deeper southern one. And then this view of the three uh, ellipsoids. And in this case, they all turn out to be oblate. So in this case, we're getting you know, plate like bodies, unfortunately, if you like. And that's, what the, that's how, it, how it played out. Uh, and then a few stats. Um, the most conductive body is this deep. Body here. Uh, otherwise, of different dimensions. And here are the conductances computed with that so, uh, most granular there. And the most, you know, well, the highest conductance body is number two, which is, uh, oh, yeah, is the deep one of the mission. The other ones are still very attractive conductors, but uh, the same explanation of. Large dimensions ahead. 
And then this is a comparison between those uh, ellipsoids and the previously run uh, 3D smooth model inversions. So for some uh, ISO surface, don't ask me what the ISO surface is, but nevertheless, the uh, ellipsoids coincide with the upper parts of these large ISO surfaces, which is encouraging. Likewise, a different view showing again the comparison between the large uh, smooth model uh, inverted results and the ellipsoids. So reasonable uh, comparison. Clearly, we've got massive difference in volume of the two there, but the smooth model inversion if you like to find large volumes of potential interest, not necessarily the sweetest parts of those conductors. So to, to sum up, uh, I was motivated to do this work because uh, not all bodies of interest are in fact planar or, or thin, and the ellipsoids are attractive because they do offer a wider range of potential shapes. Uh, a fast uh, magnetostatic algorithm has been developed for both resistive and inductive nerve responses from ellipsoids. The resistive limit current increases linearly from the center to the uh, surface of the ellipsoid, and the inductive limit current is confined to the surface. The, uh, the inversion, of course, entails in just in adjustment of the ellipsoidal parameters to achieve some satisfactory fit to the data. And the user has control as to which ellipsoids are involved in the inversion and to which parameters are involved in and whether they wish to impose say, bounds or those parameter values. And the host background response is approximated using a Hamidian's half space, which is pretty crude, but because we're dealing it's not used in the resistive limit, but even late time data, so again, it looks okay. And then we, in the examples, we've got the uh, downhole data, people, people copper example, where we uh, were able to explain data quite adequately, three ellipsoids of different shapes. And as, as I said before, I was quite pleased to see a prolate body there as the local. <laughs> Normalization often is elongated in this, uh, in this deposit. Uh, in the uh, Helixam data, again, we were able to get a decent fit to the data with three oblate bodies. The comparison between the smooth and smooth model results and the ellipsoid results didn't send out too many red flags. So it was, there was a degree of consistency there at a qualitative level. And obviously, there is. Great <laughs> non uniqueness at the very least. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the conductive ellipsoid model does represent a, a viable alternative to, uh, to plate conductor modeling. I haven't shown you an example of conversion of inductive limit data, and that's quite you know, you find a good example of that just to demonstrate that it is to affect that kind of data. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. You yeah. we'll open it up to some questions. So my, my first question, or the first, the first question can be, how fast is fast? Right? There would be talking seconds, minutes, hours. So that's the right answer. Yeah. Well, the, the first example there, the downhole one, that ran in 46 seconds. Okay. The second one, the Helisam one, I'm really not sure, but it was a much bigger data set. And I think, I think it ran in four or five minutes. But um, I did, I did, you know, to time the, uh, the first one, which is admittedly a small data set, maybe two holes, uh, three bottles, two loops. But um, anyway, 45 seconds is not so much. So give I up, consider that give up and go for a moment. On what kind of machine? It's on my Laptop. very old notebook from 2014. So, yeah, <laughs> you don't need a supercomputer. <laughs> Talked about uh, optimizing the parameters. You said fixed set parameters during each stage. 
and you do that multiple times or do you fix it during the first phase and then uh, switch to the next parameters and then update those and then switch to the next? Yeah, well, for the, these ones, I didn't actually impose any limits except in the first inversion, the downhole one, I limited the radius to 100 meters. So there was a hard limit on the radius of any of any solids. But you did it in stages. No, no, I just I let it go. I just said I'm everything. Gonna, I'm just going to let you go. I gave it the starting values. I think in that case, it's th about 30 meters here, uh, and then I just let it do what it wanted. That point. But obviously, you can impose any limits you wish. Um, that's fine. The reason for imposing the three of the hundred meter limit? Not really. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to know because I, I didn't go back and undo it. So <laughs> that's something I could try to see what it can take longer to double that. It, it, it probably doesn't take any longer. Uh, and I don't, it's hard to predict what effect it might have actually. Because one one of the ellipsoids did hit that, thing. the other two didn't. So clearly, we have some effect on that third ellipsoid. So yeah, that's something that we can see. I was trying to figure out the mathematics of this, but the, the conductivity, the conductance rather, is zero in conductance, take the volume, through the power of volume. That's Conductivity. Does it, if you go to really prolate, very prolate, does it approach the same sort of number that you get out of uh, you know, conductivity thickness? I am close. Let me investigate that. I mean, play around like that. Just get it, get it in the very one day body and then try to compare it with a very one day plate and just see. Yeah, because that's yeah. a, that would be a critical number that um, your clients would latch on to if they saw some huge number there. And they equated it to some previous maximum model. That's right. And, and one of the one of the issues with existing modeling in general is that the conductivity is not absolute anyway. It's something that um, perhaps a limitation, right? <clears throat> and one reason it's not not absolute it's because it depends on what range of times you're actually starting with. <clears throat> if you start with a wider range of times, then generally speaking, you're going to have larger data. And in the resistive limit for a discrete conductor, the conductive conductivity is proportional to your, to your data. So you see that there is no absolute strength. Control of the conductivity that comes out of the resistive limit. So, therefore, <clears throat> you know, we could easily get a different uh, conductance coming out. So, that's something we need to be careful about. People are actually going it, to, it's, it's all, it's fine if you're looking at just one, one inversion with, say, the parametric program and you're comparing conductance one body to another and it's the best conductor. That's fine. But it's when, again, if you've got your actual inversions from one side. Mother, and you start comparing it to this color, it was pretty easy to get a perfect view. In the nickel um, case, it's, it was these bodies drilled, or is it drill holes through them? Yeah, well, this, this was experimental data handed to us after obviously they'd already drilled the mineralization between the holes. Now we now know what it is. So, yes, it, it, it was already drilled. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, it was an experimental data set, but you don't know what I don't know the details. I just know that it's primarily it's, uh, disseminated software and some massive software. I don't know exactly. I don't have the geology of what's going on. Did, did you say that you had uh, uh, an analytic solution for a conductive uh, permeable uh, ellipsoid that you're testing your coping units? Or? Yeah, so I've got, I've got an analytic solution for the 
two that I referred to, one was in, internally just here. Because I couldn't find that anywhere. And then the other one I got is for uh, an oblate spheroid, but on, on its rotational axis in the logistic unit. Um, I haven't actually thought about its acceptability in that case, but maybe it's easy to talk about that too. It could, could work with but at the moment, that solution is purely for that to be conducted at the that the plate was So that the other two I thought for the that solution. Did he have other solutions? No, he didn't. Well, he didn't offer them to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, he gave me you know, numerical results from the 3D working program. The other thing we don't have is the, just a formula for the time constants that hasn't dropped out. So in the existing limit, which we should have sort of ultimate solution that is a you know, time constant times some other number which referring to the field, the response to the field in, in space. That hasn't dropped out. So if anyone knows what the time constants are, <laughs> so it's not even to know. Well, one other question, maybe you mentioned it, but I kind of missed it on your previous slide where you were showing the results for the plate, was it you said the, the, the plate model and then your ellipsoid model and then your smooth model. Oh, yeah, I mean, there was an actual plate there? Yeah. yeah. What, can Dennis you, can tell you about the plate. Can, I don't know. can you go back? I was just wondering oh, okay, how, right, how, sure. they, how they matched up. That was done by a third. Not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one? Yeah. yeah. And then they're very different in dip and everything. So, yes. Well, it was done by another consultant, and um, he was consulting to purchase some. He did that before uh, we ran it with EM 3D. And I was just happy that they, you know, landed on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to drill down there. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, right. Okay. And by the way, that uneconomic mass of sulfide just to uh, advocate the emergency here and because I was told that you shouldn't say that. <laughs> Did they not tell you that? Uh, it is, there is economic sulfides in those holes to drill. To drill two holes and do it pit sulfides and there is copper in the holes, but it's a very, very little grade and it's very deep. So, you know, it's a junior company that don't have much money. They're trying to raise money. I actually just got a, a flow through share thing now, but it's all going towards the project in effect. So this thing is just gonna sit there until somebody comes along and put more money in as they drill down 700 meters into this thing. Some more borehole. We did borehole in EM on that deep hole and there was a nice um, in-hole conductor. So it's very conductive. It just doesn't have quite the grade that the main ore body is doing this. So the un is in that. Yeah. Put a bracket. So, on. <laughs> so actually, while, while the word helixam, I've got two two comments. One is that uh, your time for inverting the helixam data would be a little bit less than what we did for the Lord Creek, which was like about <laughs> two days. <laughs> the, the second is that uh, uh, Ken literally gave a talk at Cakes. Yes, we're talking about history of helicopter yep. Yep. EM time, helicopter time domain great data, yeah. right? So that was that was pretty good. I want to remind people here, and this maybe nobody would know, that it was about 43 years ago that you gave a talk at the BCGS here down in the engineers club, where you had advertised it in your title was HTEM, right? And your talk was on horizontal loop, you know, the inversion of horizontal loop time domain EM data, right? Which was peak thesis. <laughs> the community at large was so excited about all this helicopter stuff that they thought, oh, HTEM is helicopter time domain EM. <laughs> but you drew this huge crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you see, there's a loop on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They all got up and walked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Wonderful. If there's any questions from the online people, feel free to unmute and jump in. Consideration of the, of the inversion. So, as you said, we don't have a formula for the time constant on the and you and from what I understand, what we're inverting is for the the integrated time, the resistivity. Correct. So I'm just thinking, like along with those three axes of the so is there going to be one of the time constants that's going to be bigger than the other? And so at the end of the resistivity, the two that the Basically, two of the dipole will have to decay while one's going to be dominant. Yes. And so I'm wondering if that resistivity limit is only seeing that single dipole, and if you're losing any information in that integration by ignoring maybe the like the moderate time channels or things like how the how the the magnification change direction is back. Yeah. Now you're right. If you if you go to the you know actually the limit of time, then the the, the mode is a minus time constant would be the only one, or be the dominant one, so the only one that still, still functions, still, still flowing. <laughs> but in real data, we're running a limited amount of time. And so, you know, take the view that if, if they've been excited, they'll still be there, and they'll have different magnitude depending on the, uh, on the shape, and the shape of the ellipsoid conductivity. And also the orientation of the here, so that they're they're taking they're, they're all being present in, in the data, and then one will be more dominant than the others to a degree because it's it's the most favorable orientation that the label sort of has it for plane for polygonals and the large dimension is the most favorable. And so it'll tend to be dominant, but you're quite right in the, in the limit. There's only going to be really one mode left, or maybe none, because <laughs> <laughs> the others are all gone. And you, you didn't have any primary field in the, in the direction you wanted, so yeah. yeah. Well, that speaks to your comment before that you can't look at this technique that's being absolute. You can't compare one survey against another one ten kilometers away. It's all sort of, you just can't uh, compare the, the numbers, the conductivity, the conductivity difference. It, well, there's some comparison. If you're always using, using the same system, same size group, and using the same times, then you've got, you've got terrible data. Okay. Yeah, but if you're varying that, then yes. But you can't compare it. If, if, if a V10 survey is a small one in this area, then you come in and drill it, and you do this, you get a you know, wildly different number. Um, From how yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to be careful because not, most of the time, or generalization. Most of the time, we're not too fussed about the absolute activity. Right. And we just want to know where to help. So, for that purpose, it's okay. But absolutely right. You start comparing these ellipsoids or any resistance in the solution to one that they're into another, but you're very careful. People are actually putting faith in those technology. Yeah, you find a lot of clients who like to equate those two methods to make them great. <laughs> That in of itself, it's even could potentially be reversed with some sort of yeah. going to sleep. Yeah. How important is the seed position for your your spheres for your starting division? Are they kind of is it important to get them close to get a reasonable answer or throw a couple spheres in the middle like to do with something like that? Yeah, well again, I haven't. Or that it's more simply, but I was encouraged in that first example when I put what I thought was a decent starting position and it moved on over 100 meters um, away. Maybe the position I thought that was encouraging, but no, I haven't looked at it exhaustively. Sort of started again with the um, heli sand, just <laughs> put spheres in the surf, something crazy, and see what happens. Yeah, I'd be curious. If I mean, with you know, with other programs like Maxwell, the user has to decide where we're going to start and what you know, those going to assign. So it's it'd certainly be obviously worse than that. But I just 
think we have ways to maybe automate that process as much as possible. But yeah, I haven't looked into it. Yeah, because Maxwell's very dependent on where you started. You're pretty wildly unrealistic answer. You have to start off with a reasonably good guess. And then that speaks to the number of volumes too. You have to oh yeah, just the profiles. Yeah. How many you got to throw in there? To start. Definitely same yeah. default model with more volumes than is required. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Further to Ross's question, um, you know, just thinking about the, the preparation of the data, you know, the interpretation of the data itself before you actually run it through the inversion process. Can you speak to user experience level? Is there any sort of like guidance there um, compared to using the W3D or any kind of inversion? Uh, well, the data prep is basically the same in terms of talking about just preparing the data itself. Because you'd be deciding what channels you want to actually include in your inversion. And then there's a utility program that you run to use the input data from that. So with that, if you're just referring to that part of the process, it's exactly the same. But then the model, starting model creation is different for the two programs. And then in the case of the ellipsoid thing, it's very much what we we're just talking about. You either yourself decide how many of the maybe maybe you could use if you want to 3D guide you. Um, in Big Bang 3D, if it's just an unconstrained inversion, then as part of that initial utility, or when it, when the utility is running, the utility integrating data also gets an idea of where the extent of the data. And of course, it knows the data sampling and so on. So it puts defaults at the top of the data file of the recommended model parameters. And if you want to just accept those defaults, then it's very quick. You can go from the data to a you know, rectangular mesh that's suitable for the in 3D. So that, that's quite fast, quite a little So although it may seem ridiculous to do a 3D inversion to get started with this sort of inversion, it actually can be quite, quite quick. And the, the compact body inversion is very fast as well. It's really just you might run it for three or three, four or five iterations, and that's it. All you want to just to pick the first three or four or five the starting locations. So it's uh, yeah, it's not out of the question at all to go that route. Right. I, I like the example that you show where you can buy the three D inversion BPM three D, and then with the uh, the parametric results. And you know, to me, it seems like a good example for that would be where you've got where you're looking for a discrete conductor and a conductor post, yeah. and where the unconstrained three inversion is quite involving the discrete target. You take that information, try to refine it to an actual target that the geologist can drill. That's wrong. Yeah, it's the idea that the, the ellipsoid or the compact conductor is opening guiding into the sweet spot. Right. But that seems that that's the best way to use this. Do the BPM first, and then do the parametric. Yeah, I think that's I think that's got legs, and that remains to be seen. But yeah. <laughs> and you also need to get a background. Yeah, get and you get that out of the BPM. Yeah, well, that's done and done automatically. You can set that up so that each iteration is to what background it's to. speed when you take the sources. So if you do something with a, a single receiver, single loop, or variable, you still find the algorithm is pretty quick. It's quick and it's going to be slower. It's slower, yeah. It's fundamentally quick because it's just a matter of just do you know of anybody using it for a 3D, for a, a, a big airborne survey? The parametric program? Yeah. Well, no, it hasn't been released yet. Oh, so I'm talking to Nero. Yeah. Oh. 
Well, they've told me October. <laughs> Out of my hands, unfortunately. Wonderful. There's no other questions. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> And uh, a group of us, I'm sure, will head to uh, King's Pub for a beer and more informal discussion. What's that? It's the Lions. Oh, the Lions, sorry, the Lions. Pub. Yeah. What happened to the moves? <laughs> they have started.